um, for coming out this evening. Um, I am Barry Schroeder and am on the chamber, chamber board. This is Robert Blackwell as well as a um, board member. And uh, obviously we're here this evening primarily just to uh, talk about the proposed mill levy for Elk Creek Fire Department. And uh, we just kind of wanted to um, put forth kind of a little bit of the agenda, but also um, how we kind of anticipate the evening going. Um, what we're going to kind of outline uh, is give um, a couple individuals the opportunity to kind of uh, explain um, uh, from the fire department's uh, point of view, uh, kind of what they feel like is needed um, within the community and so forth, and, and then also, um, I guess, uh, kind of a differing opinion, if you will. Uh, so we recognize that this issue in particular um, has been something that people within the community tend to be a little passionate about. Uh, and so we're just asking everybody to be obviously very respectful of one another, be adults about it, um, have an open and candid conversation. And uh, Robert's going to kind of um, put out a couple um, talking points and, uh, as far as how this will go. Each, each kind of side, if you will, will kind of have a 20 minute uh, go. And uh, we'd like to keep that without uh, too many interruptions. Uh, let them kind of have their kind of have their speak, and then at the end we'll have uh, some questions and answers. Uh, so Robert, can uh, take over from here. Henry Robert was a general in the U.S. Army, and around 1920, somebody asked him to straighten out this mess, and, uh, and uh, delivered bodies that uh, the government was involved in. So he came up with Robert's rules of order. And my name's Robert, but I'm not that. Long. <laughs> um, and a couple of the things that I've stumbled across that really make a lot of sense, and, and you'll see it in, in the House of Representatives in the Senate. Uh, Henry Roberts says, do not make any personal attacks on individuals. Just because, and this is my twist here, just because a person is paid fireman does not make his presentation incorrect. Just because a person has had a dispute with the district does not make his presentation. So the, uh, the next item that Henry Robert addressed was we don't question the motives of the person speaking in opposition to your position. Address only the results of his position if adopted. So uh, <clears throat> that's what Henry Robert said. That's the way to have a civilized being. So I think we, uh, I think we're going to have uh, Chief McLaughlin and your uh, start if you want to come up and sure. um, we're going to break this up into two 20 minute um, kind of segments if you will. So how about it? Okay, thanks. Um, I've got to apologize. I'm really tired right now. It's been a long, long weekend. So uh, pardon me if I'm not off on the phone talking here. Um, so, I uh, just wanted to, you know, uh, mention one thing, and that is that, uh, you know, in what I'm going to be talking about, I um, am not taking one side or another in this, uh, in this uh, discussion. That's not uh, something that uh, I'm either allowed to do or that, I, or that I would feel personally would be my uh, responsibility to do. Um, you know, the... Uh, uh, Colorado has the Tabor Law, which basically in 1992 said that uh, you know all uh, decisions about uh, funding increases or decreases uh, need to go before the vote of the people. Uh, they can't be imposed by uh, by any jurisdiction. And I think that's actually an excellent law, and it's a, it's something that I am very passionate about. And always have, that you know it is up to the people of the community to decide what they want to fund, to what degree, and my job, instead of advocating for or um, you know uh, pushing any any agenda on that, is to uh, do the best that I can to educate people about what services we can provide, and um, you know at what level of funding. So uh, the, you know the, the fire district 1992 was when Tabor was passed. Uh, the fire district has not uh, increased funding since then uh, and um, is currently funded at 4.9 mills. Uh, and the board has voted to uh, make a request for a 2.5 mill increase uh, in, um, 
that would be a, a 10 year period. And that 10 years would basically uh, be intended to primarily to um, replace equipment that the, that the fire district has. Um, it was some of the questions that, that uh, were given here uh, I'd like to address because they do uh, relate very well to uh, <laughs> the issues that the fire district is looking at. Uh, one of them is uh, you know, basically the, uh, the fleet. Um, you know, currently, uh, the, uh, when, I, when I started, uh, the fire district had 24 vehicles, and of those, uh, quite a few are, are older vehicles. Um, and uh, my, my plan moving ahead, I mean, we've actually pared down that fleet already, and uh, the plan moving ahead is going to be to continue to reduce that fleet and essentially try to make the district more efficient. Uh, right now, we're paying almost 10% of the uh, funding for the district goes to pay for insurance, and about 10% pays for maintenance. And that is really high compared to uh, most districts, most uh, fire departments. Uh, that's exceptionally high. Uh, so as we're moving ahead, we're going to try to reduce both those insurance and maintenance costs. And in part, we're going to be doing that by uh, basically trying to uh, create a more, more efficient fleet. Um, the, uh, and, and as we move ahead, you know, the plan that, uh, that I have put to the, the commissioners in conjunction with this measure would reduce the, the, uh, uh, basically the fire apparatus fleet to 17 vehicles and would make it at the same time a lot more efficient uh, and, uh, and basically more effective as a firefighting force. Um, basically, in the short term, uh, we'd be, you know, dropping a number of the of the older vehicles, including the two old tenders, uh, the old uh, fire engine that's up on Conifer Mountain, uh, the SUVs, uh, the plow truck, uh, one of the brush trucks, and the rehab truck. And basically, you know, most of those are either really old or vehicles that we don't uh, use a lot. And in, and basically, we turn around and replace uh, the two older tenders and then pick up two uh, Type 3 interface engines. And the reason that I want to uh, look at doing that is that it's a lot more efficient. Uh, it's, a, it's an apparatus that can both do structure firefighting and wildland fire, firefighting. And at the same time, instead of spending $550,000, which is about the average cost of a new uh, structure fire engine, uh, one of those would cost us about $350,000. So we'd be able to operate a lot more uh, effectively uh, in doing that. So the measure that, uh, that we're proposing, uh, what, what I have looked at or proposed to the, to the district would be that that uh, measure be used to purchase um, those four vehicles that we're looking at on, on a lease basis, uh, go into apparatus or into station maintenance, uh, it would be used to purchase uh, uh, more replacement PPE. Uh, one of the issues that we've run into is that we have stopped taking any new volunteers uh, because we can't afford it. Uh, you know, every time, you know, to take a new volunteer on costs us about $10,000 uh, if we have to equip them entirely. Now, a lot of times we've got equipment already on hand, uh, but uh, even if we have to buy just a coat, uh, you know, that's a... Uh, about 1200 bucks uh, just to get them in a, in a jacket if we don't have one. Um, so uh, the PPE would be one of the purchases and then um, the only operational thing that we would do other than the PPE would be to replace one of the positions that we cut. Uh, over the last uh, year uh, I've cut uh, basically two and a half positions and uh, we would be restoring one position out of those two. Uh, and that would be essentially the kind of the limit of, of our staffing over the over the at least the next several years. Um, so let's see. Uh, these are mostly questions that folks can ask if they if they have questions on that. Um, the, um, 
and again, I, I can't, you know, speak. I can't speak on for or against this particular measure, but I, you know, again, I want to explain kind of what um, we would anticipate would happen if uh, the funding is replaced versus if it is not. Um, we, um, you know, the district before I got there has asked for funding for this purpose. I believe at least twice, um, and I'm not sure, you know, what uh, really went on before that. Uh, and primarily because of the, the aging apparatus. One of the issues that we have to address is that, uh, you know, next year we are going to be uh, re-rated by ISO. And uh, there, I, I'm going to just be honest with you, even with the measure, we are probably not going to maintain the current rating that we're going to. Uh, you know, the, the best we can hope to do is to try to keep the rating from uh, going down significantly. Uh, part of it is that uh, with the new rating rules, we're really pretty far behind on being able to maintain certain, certain features of it. And the, the biggest one of those is the uh, water tender credit. Um, that has changed since the district uh, last tested for that in 2004. And at that time, the rating, uh, if you got the credit, you could maintain the same rating as you have for hydrant areas. Uh, now, uh, districts are being rated on a three-part scale. So there's a hydrant area credit, a non-hydrant area credit, and then uh, what they call unprotected areas. Right now, about uh, 20, almost 20% of the population lives in what are considered unprotected areas which means they pay the highest possible insurance rates out there. Um, the people that live in all of the areas other than those that have hydrants uh, are probably going to go to uh, an intermediate level of, uh, uh, of um, so right now we're a five in those areas. Uh, if, even if we kept the five, we're going to be at a five in the hydrant areas, probably a six or seven uh, in the non hydrant areas, and then a 10 in the areas outside there. Best case scenario. Without the funding, uh, you know, we really have, don't have any, uh, any luck of, of keeping that non hydrant area below an 8. Um, it's going to either be an 8 or a 9 uh, with our current equipment and our, our current uh, staffing. So that's certainly one of the issues. Now, uh, not everybody is covered uh, or has insurance that is rated on ISO. Uh, many people have insur insurance uh, under companies that have their, their own uh, decision-making system about how they will set that. Um, but all of those are you know, based on distance from stations, uh, capabilities, staffing, uh, the, you know, how many pumpers we have, what they can do. So, you know, the losing those capabilities is going to going to impact uh, that insurance rating. Um, I don't think that that uh, is the uh, biggest issue that the people of the community should look at with this. I think the biggest issue really comes down to uh, you know what level of fire protection uh, does the community want. What, what is it that you want the fire department uh, to be able to do? Um, so, a couple of the, the, thing, the other things that uh, were, you know, have been brought up I would like to discuss. Um, one of them is the you know, union issue. Uh, and I want to explain to everybody that Colorado is not a union state. Um, the firefighters who work, the career firefighters for Elk Creek Fire, uh, may belong to the IAFF. They have no collective bargaining rights, and they cannot have collective bargaining rights, uh, rights without a vote of 50% of the, of the population. And they can't even put that to a vote of, of the people without uh, first uh, getting you know, basically a petition of 10% or more of the population. So, uh, you know, calling any of those career firefighters union firefighters is really misleading. They're, they're not union as far as the fire district is concerned. They have no uh, rights 
uh, for maintaining their job. They can't negotiate for, for wages. And basically, um, you know, the, the, only, the only thing that I have seen them do as a union is the fund drives for, for NDA. So um, the, uh, the other discussion about that, uh, as far as what the district's plans are there, once again, we cut two union positions, union positions. Uh, we are proposing to replace one position. That position is not eligible to be in the IAFF. So that's, uh, you know, that's really uh, not, not an issue uh, in, any, in any respect with the, the fire district moving ahead. So. Can you name so, the position you're cutting? We cut uh, the fire marshal and uh, a training officer, and the proposal would be to have one position that would do both of those jobs if we replaced it. Yeah. Do you want to do questions, or do you want to let the uh, next seven minutes are yours? I, you know, I'm good. I, I, I'll go take a nap for a second. <laughs> <laughs> I have, I've been running on uh, two out of two or three hours of sleep for a week here, so. <laughs> yeah, we basically just had a 500 year flood, so not only are we working for fire protection, but um, yeah, he's been all over work that. Did you, did you want to take questions from the floor, Robert? Or Barry, or? Um, well, Barry's in charge. <laughs> <laughs> you know what, while, while it's fresh, why don't we just do the questions sure. if you're okay? Yeah. And, uh, that way we don't skip back and forth. Okay. So. I, have, I have a question. Yeah. A, do you have a dollar figure for how much the increase would be, like on a three hundred thousand dollar house or something? Um. Do you want a chair? No, I don't have to be. If I sit down, I'll do the stuff. Yeah. Really, this has been uh, not the not the greatest view right here. Do you want to copy that brochure? Yeah, if you, if you do. And this is, um, just saying this is prepared by the Friends of Elk Creek, but it's what we, but it's right here. I would, I would assume, uh, yeah, again, yeah, this is uh, one of the Friends of Elk Creek uh, brochures, but yes. Um, so, what, uh, Okay. So that does have uh, the rates uh, that I did provide to to the group uh, on the request on the uh, on that, and that is right now um, the rate for a three hundred thousand dollar house currently is one hundred and seventeen dollars, uh, and with the increase that would go to one hundred and seventy seven. Is that per year? That's per year. And it's over ten years. Right. right. Well, Bill, I have a question. Then. Yeah, fifty percent owed somebody to collect the bargaining rights. What where is that? You know, signing in the statute. Um, I don't know the 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 statute, the particular statute that it actually they just did uh, pass a law that made it easier for uh, for the uh, firefighters to to be you know actually become a recognized union, uh, but. The new rule, which is the easy one, easier rule for them to get, is the one where they can go out with a petition to put it on the ballot. That's really the only change that's in there. But um, yeah, that uh, you know, there you can't have uh, collective bargaining with public employees without uh, having that 50% vote. And I, you know, if you want, I can email you the only point of rule. Sure, that would make a lot of people feel better. Sure. Okay. Do you know, uh, based on the 2013 budget, without the middle levy, what the revenue is expected to be from taxes versus if this passes, what that looks like? Um, for 2014. Right. Um, well, you know, if you'd like, this is actually the 2013 uh, budget. This is that's also got the uh, the audited figures for last year. And right now you can see that uh, 
the um, amount that for 2013 that the district was, is authorized for is 882,000 for Jefferson County and 98,000 for uh, Park County. Unfortunately, what we've been seeing is that uh, we're only collecting about 96% of that, so it's going to be less. And then the figures for 2014 will be uh, reduced 4%, so will be $49,000 less in taxes available for, for the district for 2014 and 2015, because the, uh, the budget's a, a biannual uh, thing. So once they've done that assessment for the next two years, you know, we're going to see another $50,000 cut uh, for the, in the budget. And what does it look like if, you, if the tax increase passes? What does the revenue look like? Um, that, I don't recall the exact number off the top of my head. I believe it was somewhere around 300000 in additional revenue uh, that, uh, that would be available to the district. Um, numbers, are these numbers available? Readily available to members of the community who want to review it? Oh, absolutely, yeah. How do they go? Uh, you, can, you can email me. Uh, the, the numbers from next year's budget, uh, you know, we just got the assessment part of that uh, from the county. Uh, so now, you know, over the next several weeks, I have to develop the first draft budget, and that will be presented at the October uh, Board of Directors meeting. And are these numbers periodically audited by an uh, by, uh, independent firm? We're, we're audited on an annual basis. Uh, so every year, the auditors go through and look at all of our, uh, all of our finances uh, very, in very uh, deep detail and produce a lot of Oh, so tell me that. And I've audited financial statements for 2012 available on the website as well. They are. I think if you're asking about the revenue, the district's really not in charge of that. They just say that here's the mill levy and the county gathers the revenue and sends it to the district. Right, right. Two counties. Can you talk about the rating that you were mentioning? You have to maintain a certain rating to so that the insurance costs don't go up? Or is when, when ISO is going to inspect you or whoever? Right, okay. So couple of things about that. First off, insurance is going to go up, and it's going to go up in a painful way for everybody. Um, you know, the, and we're, we're actually somewhat fortunate that the one oddball thing out there is floods, uh, because if floods were covered under normal insurance, we would all be in big trouble right now. Um, huge trouble. Fortunately, the flood, flood insurance is a whole separate thing that's underwritten by the government and you know it dates back to I don't know 1920s or something anyway don't want to get too far off track but uh, um, basically you know the many of the fire uh, insurance companies that have done business in Colorado have left the, the state they are not going to write insurance uh, in the state the ones that are still writing are um, scrutinizing everything they can. Uh, many people, you, you may have already uh, had an issue with uh, insurance companies that are now coming out to homes. And uh, some of them are you know, doing inspections and giving you good advice. Some of them are doing inspections and then writing requirements so stringent that you could never meet them. And you know, basically, I'll be honest, it really looks to me like they don't want your business if you live in the mountains. Um, you know, the, the most common phone call that I get on a daily basis now is from either homeowners or insurance companies uh, that are either complaining about the rates or, you know, wanting more information and, and, and dealing, you know, basically digging into everything that we have. The biggest area that we have a, huge, a big problem with is Shadow Mountain. Uh, you know, basically Shadow Mountain got overlooked for a long time uh, because, you know, I mean, for some reason, ISO had given it the class 5 rating, and, but it's outside the 5 mile limit. When they changed that, all of a sudden, people are calling up and saying, my insurance just went up $3,000. What's that rating based on, though? 
just their assessment of a certain fire department? No. Well, it, it, you see, the ISO is an independent uh, organization that basically grades fire departments across the country. And they look at your equipment, your staffing, the fire hydrants, how good your dispatch system is, uh, you know, and a whole host of, of, of factors. And then they go through and they rate that. So training, uh, you know, fire prevention, and everything, there, it's what's called deficiency points. So, you know, they go through and they'll say, okay, well, like, for example, we don't have a full-time training officer anymore. Well, that just cost us about 40 points, okay? Uh, we don't have a full-time fire marshal anymore. That cost us about 12 points. Um, you know, as you go through, they look at everything. They look at our training records. And then when they get done, they send back a letter and say, this is how many points you have. And the higher the points, the higher you have to pay for insurance. Um, 2004 was on an old system. The more points the fire house gets, the higher our insurance is? Right, right. Class one is the best, okay? There's only like 12 class one fire departments in the entire country. Uh, class 10 means, you know, you don't even have to have a fire department. You live in the woods, that's basically what they're saying. And unfortunately, even though we have a fire department and it responds to some of those areas, you're five miles or more from a fire station, boom, they consider you unprotected. Um, the district at some point in the past went to address that by, they bought property up in the Shadow Mountain area with the intention of putting a fire station in there, um, but never had the money to build the station. And so at this point, we own a vacant piece of land. Uh, and um, you know, at this point, I don't, I don't see any feasibility that we're going to address that or Elk Falls, which is another big problem for us because Elk Falls is, is falls out of that area. Uh, and those areas, you know, I've been trying to work out some way to get credit for them. Uh, Shadow Mountain in particular, uh, you know, I'm, I'm trying to work on a program to get credit from the, the uh, Evergreen Fire Station that's out there, but ISO will not recognize it. And, uh, no, and most insurance companies, um, because I'm an insurance agent, they go by your responding fire department. So people up on Black Mountain are very close to the Evergreen one off the forest, but that does not qualify. You could be one mile from that, but it's going to go by your responding fire department. You can check the county records with your address. It'll tell you exactly on the, the county records what fire department responds to you. If it's Elk Creek, you, it doesn't matter how close you are to Evergreen at this point. And I don't see that changing in the near future, to be, to be frank. Which is unfortunate because I, I would totally agree. It's very frustrating from the insurance perspective. Why don't we do one more question and then we'll kind of switch switch to the other side here and then we can open it back up for questions at the end for, for either individuals. How much were we you know so I can get a handle on it? How much say did you get in the year two thousand compared to what you're getting now? Going back to 2000, I'm not really sure. You know, for a lot of years, the, the, the district was getting more each year because there were more houses being built. Uh, that, you know, the housing stopped, the housing bubble stopped in 2008. But there's a two year lag in uh, the collection process. So uh, they actually continued to collect a little bit more each year up through 2010, and then it started dropping off. Uh, since 2010 uh, to, you know, 2014 for next year's budget, it's uh, about, I believe, 16% uh, decrease. And, and again, because... What are dollars? Dollars, dollars yeah. so that would be... Um, yeah, there you go. I'm not very good at doing math when I'm tired. But. Okay, now... So, what did you get in 2010? 2000, well, 2011, I can say we got, you know, about uh, 1.16 1. million. Okay. And uh, last year, we got about 9.5 million. So, and then, this, you know, this year, we're looking at about, you know, basically 1.4, a little better. Next year, will be under 1.4. 
Oh, I'm sorry. I'm, I am tired. One point, one million and, and uh, oh, 40,000. I'm sorry. So now we paid you one million, uh, 100,000. So basically, yeah, we've lost, uh, actually, we've lost uh, um, more than that 100,000 uh, because we also have seen a decline in, in ambulance billing. Uh, and that's come for a number of reasons. One is that Medicare has cut their reimbursement rates. Uh, so they pay us less and we, we can't negotiate that. Um, and then, you know, basically the, the other insurance companies, you know, that, that, that figure has gone down as well. So uh, for, you know, the, the, final, um, the final picture between uh, 2011 and what we have budgeted for this year is about a $190,000 increase. Decrease? Yes. And then again, another $50,000 for next year. Probably, 
we, and we expected it when I was on board as the treasurer. We knew this was happening, and we took measures to, uh, to, to bring in our spending to, uh, to make sure that uh, we could get through this section. Because we knew it was going to go down and then and back up eventually. Uh, some of the things I'm very concerned about with the district <coughs> is that, let me go back. Another thing that I have, which is posted on their website, is the audit. Uh, if anybody likes to read really dull, boring uh, um, things, it's, it, there's a ton of information in here as well. Uh, one of the things in here that concerned me most was that the district overspent their budget in 2012 by more than $260,000. And there was no budget amendments, which are required by law, which almost looks like the district board doesn't know where they're spending their money. And I'm very concerned about that. The district board should be in control of the budget. They should know exactly where they're spending every dollar that goes out, especially if we're in tight times. Uh, let's see, the district receives about a, around a million dollars a year in property taxes. And that, you know, it comes from a few different sources of property taxes. It also comes from vehicle taxes and, and whatnot. Out of that million dollars a year that they receive, it would take about 30% of that, that amount of money to keep our fleet brand new, exactly the way it is right now. When I was on the board in 2010, we came up with a 50-year plan for replacing all of our vehicles. And I agree with the chief that, that we have way too many vehicles. And the vehicles, we could pare down our fleet by quite a bit. Yet still, we could fund an entire fleet with only 30% of that, of that uh, million dollars a year. Where we're spending a lot of money is, is not exactly clear. But if we, if we go back to some of the budget items over the past years, in 2012, the overtime budget was almost double what uh, the board budgeted. Uh, that hurts. That hurts a lot when we're, when we're spending a lot of money on, on overtime. The, um, things like uh, workers' comp insurance has just skyrocketed over the last four or five years. And, and that's stuff that we have control over. It's, it, if you have a high injury rate, then you get a then you get a different rating for, for things like uh, for things like workers' comp insurance. Uh, the if if you want me to get into the union interest or the union bit, I can talk a little bit about that. Um, the uh, the bill that the chief was talking about is is SB 13025, and you can go you can Google that up. It's online. It was just signed by the governor uh, a month or two ago, and uh, it, it it forces collective bargaining on small little groups, you know, small little communities such as ours, as few as two firefighters. Uh, and I, I don't think that that's something that's appropriate for for the state to be doing in the first place. The president of our board was a lobbyist for that bill. If you go on to the on to the uh, website for the Colorado Professional Firefighters Union. There's a picture of our, our board president standing behind the governor when he signed that bill. I, I don't think that's appropriate for that group, the IFF, to be messing with our, uh, our local control over, over what we do. And I, I'm not sure that we can, we're going to be able to afford to have uh, Union firefighters. If, if uh, as it continues, we really don't have a tax base for that. Our tax base was designed for a volunteer fire department, and over the years, it's it's transitioned into this paid fire department. And the voters didn't get to choose that. And uh, if 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 this vote was about if you want to pay more money for for a paid fire department then I, I could support it as being honest, at least, and, and see what, uh, see how they get them, what people say. Uh, but I don't support it because I think that we should have a volunteer fire department. Uh, the officer corps of the fire department, was, it was always a volunteer position. In 2012, the, uh, there was uh, at least three or four employees 
elevated officer status, and they all got 9% raises, although the budget says that there weren't any raises in uh, 2012. This particular election was budgeted to cost $46,000 for this November election. When we've had two in the past, one of them I was actually involved with, uh, <coughs> And we asked, and we lost by a 70% margin. And I took that to heart. The people told my board that I was on that they didn't want to pay more money. The 4.915 is brings us a million dollars a year in, in taxes. And I agree that our, our ambulance revenues are down, and we should adjust our, our staffing to reflect that that uh, those ambulance revenues. Ambulance should, should carry its, its own weight, I believe. Let's see, last year we bought a bunch of firefighting equipment that was used out of district. It wasn't bought for our district and now we're being told that we need more money to buy firefighting equipment for our district. And I don't think that's the right way to go. I think that we should be prioritizing our district needs over anybody else, including sending other people out of district to make money with our tax dollar supported vehicles and tools. Uh, they bought an ATV, they bought a, uh, a what they call a specialized uh, fire vehicle, and it's basically a giant brush truck. And, uh, and in my estimation, that was just for going, sending people out of district to go make money on our dime. It did bring in a little bit of money. The costs were exorbitant. Let's see, what else we got? The, the advantages that I see in a local volunteer fire department, and I want to speak a little bit to that, because I think this vote is going to, is going to give people the chance to say, hey, we do want a volunteer fire department. And there's huge advantages in volunteer fire departments. Uh, if you have a medic or a EMT living right next door to you that's well trained and has the equipment, that takes your response time down from however long it takes to get from station one to your house, which could be 20 or 30 minutes, to right next door. Three minute response time. And you have somebody taking care of you until the ambulance gets there. And that's, the, that's a huge advantage for, uh, for being a, a, a local volunteer fire department. We live here. You know, if, if your house is on fire, four of your neighbors are likely to be firefighters and they'll get there before the engine does and they can start to work before the engine even gets there. And that's a, that's a giant advantage other than having one staffed fire station that is going to be there you know, whenever they get there. Uh, I think we need to put our efforts into more local volunteers. They know the roads, they know the hills and valleys, they know the lookout points, they know everything that there is to know about this district. We, we live here, we walk, we hike here, we know exactly where if a smoke call comes in at a certain address, I know exactly what rock to go to to stand up and go find it and give, and give people directions in to, to what is going on. Uh, huge advantage there. Let's see what else I got here. That, oh, I do have one more answer. I heard a question back in the back about what the, the new tax is going to bring in. That's actually on the, you can find that on the question, which is on the uh, Health Creek website. And the first year is, uh, the first year is something like four hundred and thirty-five thousand dollars. I don't know if anybody's read the question yet. It's going to be on the ballot. Definitely written by a lawyer. $482,138 in, in the first year of collection. And then, you know, it goes, it goes up from there because our property values are going to go up. 
with that. Uh, it's, it has a 10 year sunset, which I am highly doubtful that, that you know, that would be two more boards down the road, and then there, there won't be a sunset on this. So we better figure on, uh, on sticking with it. The other thing that's on the, uh, on the Elk Creek website is the report from the committee, which is interesting, an interesting read. I, I would suggest everybody read that. And the, the uh, committee report and the question for the tax increase don't even match. The, the board didn't even follow the recommendations of the committee to, to, to uh, ask for this money. So I don't know why they would have a committee and then not follow the recommendations of the committee, but that's that's the way these guys operate. That's about all I can. Okay. But I'm, I'm ready to take questions. Let me do this. <laughs> Yeah, I got a question. I, uh, I understand you're feeling about volunteer versus pay, but I got to ask, how is that? How is having a mill levy going to change if there's a neighbor next door to volunteer? If anything, they can increase it. They're looking to buy more good, buy more gear, so they can have more volunteers. Right now, they're turning volunteers away. This mill levy can only increase volunteers, if I understand correctly. Well, well, one of the arguments is that that it costs ten thousand dollars to 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 put on a new volunteer. Mm -hmm. Well, I was a volunteer for 10 years and they didn't spend $10,000 on me. I can guarantee you that. Uh, uh, you know, a set of gear was obvious. I got, I got one new set of gear in 10 years. I bought my own boots. Uh, the membership, I was actually the president of the membership one time. So the membership has this little donation letter they used to send out. So the membership actually took a lot of their money and bought helmets for us at one, at one point. So we own our own helmets. There, there's a lot of ways to make money. Um, I, I guess you're not answering It doesn't cost $10,000 to outfit. You're, you're not answering my question. You really implied that one will negate the other. You're saying that this, you know, we're here talking about the mill levy. You're saying that we're not, we're going to have less volunteers. How is that connected? No, I don't say we're going to have less volunteers. I said what we need to do is, is put our uh, efforts into local volunteers and not put our efforts into uh, out-of-district volunteers that come in here for free training and then after two years they're gone. So we have that big, there is a big investment in, in a volunteer in the very beginning. And, uh, yeah, about $10,000. Yeah. yeah, I don't think so. But, I mean, if you have that number, if you have that detail, I'd like to see that. There is, they have those records that we can get. If somebody's willing to ask for them, they're willing to give us to uh, Yes? On that same line of questioning, so is it your proposition that we should be completely volunteer and not have any paid staff? Because currently we have three paramedics, we have three EMTs, we have a fire chief, and we have an admin, and I think I'm missing one more chief. But are you saying that none of those positions should be paid? We should be all volunteer? No. Okay, so would you like to elaborate on who, who would you? We've had the first paid position, and I'll give you a little history. I've been around here for a while. First paid position we ever had at Elk Creek was the uh, fire marshal, and that's uh, and that goes to looking at fire safety issues and uh, prevention and stuff like that. Prevention is always the best way to take care of a fire. If you don't have one, that's always your best. Place. So I think that the district, and I'm not sure exactly when they put on the fire marshal. That was a long, long time ago. And then the next position they put on was a was a, a paid chief. Because the administrative sort of things were, uh, you know, were overwhelming for a, a guy to get done with work and then go and and, and do all that uh, extra work at night. And it was a part-time paid position. And you know, we had some somebody, somebody did that. I can't remember the guy's name. Uh, next paid position was a daytime responding paramedic that would bring the ambulance, the calls, and then the, the uh, EMTs already lived in the neighborhoods and lived around and they found little groups of people that were, that were uh, uh, responding for days or nights or they, it was basically a shift 
sort of uh, thing. And then so the, uh, the paramedic had always an ALS ambulance on, on in the daytime, and then that was expanded to do three shifts, and then I expanded to do uh, a paid driver, and now it's expanded to have paid officers, and then it was expanded to have a paid training officer. So it, it just kind I'm of- I'm still unclear right. though as to as we've grown as a community, and I think any of us know the need for the, the wildfires we've seen in the last few years are more than I've seen in my 11 years being here. So I'm asking currently, not what the history is, but currently, if you want to be an all volunteer, who would be paid at our fire department to I run don't things? Want to be an okay, but you're not answering my question. Who would you propose right now to be paid? You already said we have too many paid staff, I would, I but would. you don't want to be all volunteers. So who would you have be a paid staff? I would at, be. Okay, I department? would pay as many staffers as the tax can afford, and still buy our equipment. We need, I think our equipment should be a priority. And that's, and that's only 30% of the, of, the, of the taxes that we get from property. And the annuals brings in revenue as well. So there's, you know, our budget this year is like, it's, it's $1.6 million. Well, one last question. It takes 300000 to, to, to uh, keep our vehicles in, uh, in, you know, brand new condition, basically. And that's what, that I got off of the, uh, off of the uh, committee report, by the way, which is available on the website. Okay, one last question. Were you not quoted in the newspaper several years ago uh, that you were in favor of the bill levy increase? I was on that bill levy increase. Okay, and so what has changed your mind? that all of a sudden now, after you've left the department, you're no longer in favor of the levy increase? Because at that time, the department was very transparent. And we were posting our, our uh, detailed financial statements all the time. And we basically, we asked if people wanted to dedicate a mill levy just to vehicles. And I'm not sure exactly what it was. It wasn't a two and a half. It was like a .9 or something dedicated to just vehicle purchases. And, and really, you can't guarantee that any no levy is going to be spent on what the question says or what anybody says. The board can spend that money on anything it wants. And it likely will, including more paid staff. So the question here. So I'm just curious, based on her question and your answer, and kind of that back and forth, is a big part of this issue purely transparency in the budget? <coughs> And where money is being spent as opposed to the need for additional money, yes or no? Yeah, yeah, you know, I think is it, but I mean you in, in your kind of presentation here, it, it seemed like the transparency issue has come up a couple different times. Or, you know, we don't know, we used to do this, now we do that. I'm the new kid on the block, we've only lived here for a few years, so this is all new to me. Well, this is right now I are going to see all this stuff. Um, <laughs> um, but I'm, I'm just trying to gain an understanding of truly the two sides and the two problems. And I'm hearing a lot of transparency for me, but I don't want to put words in it. I would like, what I would have asked for from the board several times is some, is some detailed financial reports. And, and what's posted now is the audit. The audit is a, is a decent report. It, it has a lot of stuff in it. It's, it's not a detailed financial report. You can't look at the audit and say, oh, well, we're spending, you know, what well, we used to pay a guy $30,000 to be an ambulance driver, now we're paying him $80,000 to be an officer. You can't see that in the, unless you get very transparent on the, uh, on the finances. And I, I have a feeling that that's kind of what's going on, because it's more and more <coughs> And more employees, and they're being they're, the employees and the benefit packages are are keeping us from buying the equipment we, that we need. What I what I'd like to do we're at seven thirty right now, so I'd like to see um, Chief if you want to come back up and um, just take a few minutes and either readdress or bring up additional points, and then we'll give Mike the same opportunity to do that. 
and then uh, hopefully we'll have enough time that we can just kind of open the floor up uh, for uh, for Mike or the chief. Okay. Okay. So addressing some of the things that, uh, that uh, Mike brought up, um, um, once again, uh, my memory is already fading. I, I need to get some sleep. Uh, sorry. Um, with benefits uh, and number of personnel both have been reduced since I took over and uh, neither one of those is going to increase other than the one position that you know, will take the place of two previously. Uh, now I can't speak for uh, you know, what a chief three or four or five years from now will do if it's a different chief. My intention actually is to stay here uh, until um, I, I retire finally. Um, and I, I, you know, I intend, if uh, the community will support it, to uh, stay here for the next uh, nine years. That's kind of my target right now. By then I'll be pretty decrepit, you know, and uh, <laughs> it'll be time. In, in that time, um, you know, this community may change. It may have different needs, but over the next several years, we're, we're not going to be adding paid staff, and we're going to continue to keep uh, you know, salaries and benefits, uh, you know, at a, as reasonable as we can. We did re reduce uh, benefits, uh, you know, this last year, and, uh, you know, we're not talking about restoring those. The, the district is bound by the language in the, in the uh, Tabor Act, and, uh, you know, so that statement, what it says we're going to spend money on, the district is bound by that language. Uh, however, it's written by a lawyer, and lawyers will always, you know, figure out, you know, some way to write that language to leave some flexibility in it. But, you know, I, I can tell you the things that, that I'm talking about spending money on are the things that, you know, we're going to spend money on while I'm the chief. Um, the, uh, and, and that's primarily getting, getting the equipment and the stations uh, to where they need to be. Unfortunately, the stations are pretty far behind it. And maintenance as well. Uh, so, you know, we're not going to be adding additional personnel and uh, we're not going to be paying anybody $80,000. Um, you know, I don't make that and uh, certainly nobody who's working for me is making that. Um, let's see, wildland program. Um, you know, I, we bought uh, a brush truck last year for $45,000 and we put about $15,000 into that brush truck. So. We invested about $60,000 into that. That brush truck just got back from fighting the fire in Yosemite, and in one month it brought in $42,000 net. Okay. We paid for that brush truck entirely ahead of time by you know, sending our firefighters out to fight wildland fires. That program is basically supplementing our budget at no cost to the taxpayers. We're, we brought in $115,000 above expenses last year. And, you know, from the standpoint of being a businessman, I am going to try to make every dime I can that isn't going to come out of your pockets. That's what I'm going to do. And if that means that, you know, we're going to send that truck, that truck, you know, is primarily to supplement our budget. And, and uh, it's not costing anybody any local money, and it's bringing money in. So. That's that's my business take on that. Um, but one okay. minute. Okay. I don't know. Anybody know any jokes? <laughs> I have a question. Yeah, go ahead. Mike was talking about the overtime and the amount of overtime being paid. And if we have, it seems like to me we have five employees that are paid. Well, we have we have six. Uh, you know, six employees. Right. But, Plus, uh, plus the mechanic who also makes over time. Okay, so yeah. how can our over, out of those six people, it seems to me that you have an admin person, you have a mechanic, and you have a couple of EMTs that would be, I guess, could be paid over time, and you could be paid over time, and who else would be paid over time? Okay, let, let me clarify that. We have six. Uh, fire, you know, three paramedics and three firefighters. Uh, we each work two at a time. Uh, and then there, in addition to that, there's a chief, uh, admin, and 
uh, mechanic. So you got six employees, you got nine employees that are paid. Right. As we speak. Right. And out of those nine employees, six of them can gain overtime? Or uh, seven, seven of them can yeah. gain overtime? Yeah. Now, how much overtime are we paying and would it be cheaper to have another full-time person than an overtime? Um, let me tell you that exactly. And, and I'll, I'll be honest, there's two reasons that our overtime costs went up. One is that we cut two positions, sure. and you know, two things happened with that. One is we started incurring some more overtime, and the second was that I started working longer hours. Um, but, uh, and the other uh, factor that went into that is actually that um, we've been using less um, uh, of our uh, part-time personnel. So last year our, our overtime budget was forty nine thousand. And yeah, that uh, that could we couldn't get rid of all of that by hiring another person because some of the overtime it happens like uh, if the ambulance goes out at uh, seven o'clock in the morning and shift changes normally at eight o'clock, well there goes, you know, an hour and a half of overtime for two people you know, each time. Or if someone calls in sick and we can't find, you know, a volunteer to fill it, then we end up incurring overtime on that. Um, the other area that where our overtime really jumped up last year was our mechanic. Uh, you know, basically, we kind of, you know, it's a factor of, you know, when trucks start breaking down, uh, you know, and we, you know, they broke down on the side of the road, we have to bring the mechanic in. Um, I would like to see that over kind of time number get back down, um, you know, yeah, but right now it's not enough to, to fund a position, you know, where we're below where we need to be to do that. Um, so does that answer your question? Okay. Switch back one more time and then uh, it should give us about hopefully about 15 minutes at the end to just have an uh, open question and answer session. So is there anything else you want to add, Mike? Or? No. Okay. Um, so we've got, um, it's going on about 20 to 8, so I guess we've got about 20 minutes. Um, if there's any questions that anybody hasn't had an opportunity to, to ask um, either of the candidates. Um, yeah. I'm trying to, oh, I shouldn't say 20 minutes, but, um, <laughs> From the chain, I do have one question that from the board um, I think is important to maybe get out there um, as a member of the, uh, as the ch of the chamber board is I've been to multiple of these sessions and we've talked about what the rate increase actually will be based on a you know value of a home for a homeowner. Does anyone chief or otherwise have what the increase will be for a commercial property owner or a business owner? That, that is actually a question that someone did ask uh, uh, on uh, the email. Okay. Uh, and, you know, unfortunately, and this is not something the district has control over, the state of Colorado, for some reason, hey, you know, the cool thing is, because this does is not related to this measure, is I can't speak my mind on that. It's <laughs> stupid. Um, you know, I don't know why Colorado makes businesses pay more, uh, but they do, and we can't fix that locally. Uh, so, um, you know, a million dollar uh, business would be paying about seven hundred twenty-six dollars more. Thank you. I, I think pay a million times twenty-nine percent times point oh oh four nine one five. Right. I have a similar question. What, um, so we understand what the increase would be for a million dollar business. Do we understand what the tax, or excuse me, what the insurance increase would be? Um, you know, projected insurance increase would be if we go from a five to an eight for that same million dollar business. I'm assuming by your question you have the answer. I don't. Yeah, for guys, but well, I don't have the number at the top of my head, just in case people don't know. I'm a local insurance agent. However, for, for full disclosure, I am also the chair of the Friends of Elk Creek Fire. And the reason I joined the committee is because I'm very invested in this issue. I deal with clients every single day. I know insurance rates are going up regardless. I agree with Mike. They are going up regardless. 
However, even if your property does not look at ISO, does not use ISO, they will still factor in the slope of your land, how close your trees are, where is the nearest water source, what is the strength of the fire department, they will still look at that. Um, so it doesn't matter which way your insurance company looks at that, but I can tell you, um, insurance rates, if you go from a 5 or 6 to an AV, it is quite a big difference. I know for personal, um, residential homes, it's at least 20 to 30 percent more. And the reason I know this is I quote in Inner Canyon all the time, and Inner Canyon Fire they don't have a tender credit. So unless you literally have a traditional hydrant, no cistern, an actual real fire hydrant, within a thousand feet of your house, you are going to your an AB. And that's how it will end up, it could end up being here. It's, it, 20 to 30% is what, and, I, and that's the reason I know this is because I quote in that area all the time. Doesn't matter if it's in a canyon, it's, as long as it's an AB. It's usually 20 to 30% higher. It's, it's substantial. It's substantial increase. We have any chamber members with questions? Special time for chamber members. <laughs> Did you? Do you have a question or a comment? Oh, no, I, I've asked mine. I thought you just said, are there any chamber members? <laughs> <laughs> My head's still <laughs> I, have, I have a question for Mike. How would you propose that we have the ambulance service be completely self sufficient and cover its own costs? Uh, we size it to where. It, the employees are, are and, the, and the equipment for the ambulance company are self-sustaining. I don't think it ever has been totally self-sustaining, but you, ha you might have to staff it with volunteer drivers. Okay, but even if they have to go on runs and they have to transport someone who has no insurance so they can't pay for it, how are they going to make that cost up? or if Medicare is starting to they reduce what they cover, how are they going to make that cost up? I mean, you, they aren't going to make that cost up. Okay, so how so does the not with, passing a mill levy not help People with insurance that pay for the people without insurance. Just the, the ambulance service isn't, uh, isn't funded by tax. The, the district is required to provide fire service. And, it, and they're allowed to provide uh, an ambulance, to run an ambulance company. Okay. That's Colorado well, State statute. Well, living up here, I certainly would be happy, happy that ambulance service. Absolutely, and there's and there's issues. there's a lot of districts that have ambulance districts. You can have a special district just for ambulance. Okay. How do they get funded? I, the I same way. I think I was thinking that Platte Canyon passed a mill just for their ambulance district. Well, they, they did because the yeah. what happens is you don't see standalone ambulance districts anymore because you can't you can't fund it. Okay. They don't pay enough to to survive. So, so you have to have a mill levy to cover. Right. So they they went okay. defunct. But not a fire yeah. mill levy. You do an ambulance mill levy if you like, and in a lot of ambulance districts, they still have to staff their ambulances with volunteers, just like the fire districts do. Mm -hmm. we, we don't have enough firefighters, even on a good day, to fight a big wildland fire. That's why we have mutual aid, and that's why when a fire gets to a certain size, it, it goes out of our hands. There's nothing that we can do. That makes sense. And we don't have enough capacity in our tax system, no matter what. You could tax everybody 100%. And there isn't enough capacity to have a fully staffed, paid fire department up here. So what we have to do is we have to make sure our fire department is staffed at a level that we can afford. And right now our mill is set for a volunteer fire department. So if the people want a paid fire department or want to pay more money, I don't have a problem with that. I just don't think it's a reality. We lost the last election 70-30. And I took that to heart. I don't think we're going to win this election either. Well, I think things have changed since the last one, too. We've had a whole lot more fires that are just predicted to increase, too. And that's not going to change. More money no. isn't going to ha make us have less fires. No, but it'll have a better equipment, and we can get more 
personnel protective gear so we can outfit more people, right? And I do need to correct the statement. From an insurance perspective, if you have Jason's insured and I'm not, and I don't pay my bill, Jason, his insurance company is not going to pay my my $1,800 ambulance ride and his. Insurance companies have maximums, their usual and customary fees that they will pay out. And if the, if, the, if the charge for the ambulance is higher than what Humana pays as a usual and customary, guess who gets the bill for the rest? The, the person who was transported, the patient. They will only pay a certain amount. You know, and, and that's something that, that hasn't come up and I, that I would like to just kind of address that. Um, you know, the Elk Creek Fire District has gone after everybody for the full amount of their, uh, their uh, ambulance bill. That's not usual, you know, if you go to a medical, you know, your insurance pays a part of it and, they, and the, the hospital writes off the rest. Um, most ambulance services write off the rest. Uh, Elk Creek is not, we've been trying to get every dime out of it, you know, and that's not necessarily a good thing because over the past five years, the list of people in this community who've been sent to collections or you know otherwise been impacted by our demand to, to fund that has been a um, detriment to our community. And, and I'm sorry, I'm, I, I probably stepped over the line and again made an opinion statement there, um, but that, not related to this. I hope um, that that is something that you know. I think that as a community, again. We need to address it. Are we going to, you know, try to make this thing pay for itself by, you know, trying to take people to collections to pay the extra three hundred dollars, or you know, do we accept a lower ambulance rate and you know fund the rest of that, you know, to, to keep that service available? And I have a question along those lines. Do you know of any uh, ambulance service? outside of Metro Denver and outside of Metro Colorado Springs that sustain solely on their billing? No. No. And those, the only ambulance district in Jefferson County, which does have a tax levy in addition uh, to the uh, ambulance service, is uh, struggling and they're not sure if they're going to be able to stay. So this isn't an Elk Creek problem, this is a everywhere problem. Right. You, maybe, honestly, you can't. I mean, the only way that you can make money uh, and survive in a business uh, on ambulance service is to have so few ambulances that you know you keep them busy all the time. And that's not even working because most of the big ambulance companies are either bankrupt or very near it. Ambulance service is a losing proposition. And. Uh, you know, not most fire departments don't want to do it uh, because of that. But what choice do we have? If we did not provide ambulance service here, there is not a private company that would come up here to do it because they can't. They're not going to send an, you know a crew of two to sit up here and, uh, and just wait for you know to make some money. They're going to be down in town if they're doing anything where they can make money. You know, every 20 minutes when it takes them to the hospital. I was just curious if there's another website in addition to Elk Creek versus Mike. Is there another website that you were involved with that has uh, points made about uh, about this issue about this phenomenon? Uh, the information I got was from the DOLA site. Um, Is that D O L A? D O L A. Yeah, D O L A. And that's the Divisional Local Affairs site, and it's just kind of. A, Sort of a clearinghouse for information, uh, and, and that the, I don't know. I, I was looking on the Secretary of State's website tonight, and the county has, you know, they have tax information and stuff. But that's where I look to find my information. I, you know, I don't have a, I don't own. A, I'm not a computer guy at all. I mean, I have a computer, and I know how to find stuff on it, but. I don't know how to fix computers and do stuff like that. I fix houses. 
Does anyone else have any questions? I do. Um, I'm curious as to what the rate of attrition is from the membership every year. I don't have a data good fix on that. Um, I don't have a good figure off the top of my head. Um, right now, I think uh, that uh, we're, our attrition um, from last year has been two out of uh, eight rookies. Uh, for this year, um, we've had no attrition yet of, uh, uh, of the new volunteers that have gotten through. Uh, I imagine that changes from year to year. Uh, Do you know, um, the reason I'm asking is because typically as members retire or move out of the community or have changes in their lives which replenishes the bunker gear for the Rookie Academy, that bunker gear is what's used to bring in um, new recruits and train them. And as a taxpayer, it really concerns me that there's been a decision not to recruit and have a rookie academy due to a lack of gear because ultimately what that says to me is as we move down the line and people continue um, to leave the district for one reason or another, um, we don't have that the new people to feed it and then I, I foresee the next fear-based tax issue coming to us that we don't have the response to handle the call volume, therefore we need to raise money to pay more people to respond because we've stopped doing what we've done since the beginning of the department, which is to recruit and train and allow that um, allow those rookies first of all to the rookies to have their own attrition and um, and hold on to the people who are really vested in the process, uh, but also losing those other people in in the district over time due to. Retirement or or moving or whatever. I'm not sure that was much of a question. Or if I was a... I guess I'm I'm concerned that if we're not looking at what the rate of attrition is, it's a really big decision, and, and there have been a lot of big decisions made by the department, as as there always are in, in trying times. I'm a resident of Elk Falls Ranch, and and you chief released the only two EMT firefighters in my community for non-response six months after they both responded for over five days in a row at the North Florida Fire. Both of them being EMTs in a community that has no fire station and no one else to respond in my community. I'm 12 minutes from a fire station and now you're talking about eliminating the um, the Rookie Academy for this year based on a lack of bunker gear and, and so I guess Here's my question. Do we have any bunker gear in, in the equipment room? We do if you're short and wide. <laughs> my husband's gear went back to the department and he was six foot two and 170 pounds, so I guess his, his gear has been used. But I just, I, I feel like we're, we're thriving on, on fear-based factors and, um, and a lot of these things can be looked at differently. We provide uniforms, blue uniforms, to all our volunteer firefighters. The cost benefit to me as a taxpayer is zero. We bought new leather um, helmet fronts for all of the helmets. The tax cost benefit to me as a taxpayer is zero. And the board and the department are continuing to make decisions like this. We we dismissed all the volunteer captains of the stations and we made paid members, paid staff, captains of the districts, gave them raises and the cost benefit to me as a taxpayer is zero. Those captains were just as effective as volunteers as they are as paid people, except I wasn't paying for it with my money. And so now I look at the budget and since that happened and those paid people were promoted, the overtime, oh, and we had volunteers participating significantly in the training of the rookie class. That has become almost exclusively led by paid people for which they get paid overtime. And the overtime budget expenses went from 23000 to 49000 sure. And um, And I, I just, I want people to realize that we, are, we should be concerned about the equipment, but we also should be concerned about 
how money is spent and, and what the priorities are in the district because I as a community member of Elk Falls Ranch and someone who had a, a nine year vested member in the department feel like there, there are some decisions that are made that don't benefit us as taxpayers. And I support the fire department wholeheartedly and did for nine and a half years. Was, I'm not making light of this, but is there a specific question? I, I just want wanted to, to know if, if he knew what the attrition was, and, okay. and we don't, because okay. we don't look at that. Okay. Uh, just to clarify a couple of things there. One, our volunteer staffing is uh, much higher than it was when it started. The decision not to have a rookie academy uh, was largely based on the fact that uh, we have great staffing, particularly in district. Um, and my intention is to continue to, to recruit and, and use volunteers as much as possible. We've reduced paid staff, increased volunteers over the last year. Um, you know, I think that if you ask the volunteers whether or not it's important to them to have a uniform, I think you get a different answer. And you know, if that if it costs me buying a volunteer uniform to get them to volunteer, that's a lot cheaper than hiring a firefighter. Uh, another factor there, we did not get rid of all the volunteer captains. Uh, only one station has a paid captain, one paid captain. Uh, we still have volunteer captains in the department. I'd like to add one thing. If you look on the iChief's website, the national average for attrition on volunteer firefighters is two and a half to three years. Just just throwing that out there, just so people keep that in the back of their mind. National average is two and a half to three years lifespan for a volunteer firefighter. Um, I just thought we should probably ask. Um, so we could, Mike is against, she can't, you know, he was giving us facts. Is there anyone that's pro that I and mean, kind of need to have that view presented tonight? So I think, um, as I said, I'm the chair of the Elk, Friends of Elk Creek Fire, and I'm joined by a number of um, concerned citizens in the community. And one thing I do want to correct is that um, Mike had mentioned that he doesn't think um, that this will sunset after 10 years. And I am um, looking right at the Tabor question, and it clearly says, uh, the rate increase up to 2.5 mil expires after a period of 10 years ending on December 21st of 2024. It's specifically written in the Tabor question um, that that will end. So I think that probably clears up the question of anybody thinking it may not expire after 10 years. It clearly is written in what you're going to vote on. Um, and I will just briefly say, because I think most of this information was covered tonight, but Friends of Elk Creek Fire are concerned citizens. They're also business owners. I myself am a business owner in the community, uh, so I feel for my fellow business owners. Um, but we have 4,800 residents, uh, or 4,800 households, resi personal residents, and I think roughly 330, 325 businesses. So we do have to, obviously the state, we can't control what the state, how the state taxes um, commercial properties, but we have to think of our community as a whole, all the residents and businesses collectively. So unfortunately, um, you know, decisions have to be made on that. And we're, we're, just, we're just here to get the word out. I have to be honest, um, I don't remember how I voted on this, and I will tell you, I did, was not educated on the issue. The two times that I voted on this, and I think our committee as a whole wants to get the word out and educate people because I think with information, you can make a good decision. And that's all we are. We've been confronted at some meetings with some very pointed questions. Um, and it's been a little tough, I'll be honest, but we're up for the challenge because um, we don't want insurance rates to go up. We don't want our level of service to go down. We want to support our fire department. And now more than ever, they're being called upon to do far more than, they, than I believe or I've seen uh, in the 11 years that I've lived here. Um, so that's basically what we're doing. So I guess I would say just remember we're, we don't work for the fire department, we're community citizens. We're just doing the best that we can to educate the public on what the facts are. Um, and hopefully people will vote yes for this. It's well needed and a lot of the, we're going out to events, we're going to be at the town hall meeting tomorrow night, um, just to answer questions. So, and, and if anybody has any insurance questions, um, I can speak to that after the meeting because it is definitely going to impact us up here. So, I guess.
guess that's all I would say. Does anybody else have any? It's 8 o'clock. Okay. And I would like there we to go. everyone here for their consideration and thoughtfulness, especially Bill and Mike. And uh, I really appreciate this meeting. Yeah, this is a good meeting. Very good meeting.